Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks um, for having us. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, you are both part of this important study about LDL that's uh, just uh, been uh, made public. Can you talk a little bit about it? What's the What got you involved in this and why is this important for us? Well, I'm going to try to give you the elevator pitch, which is usually hard for me. But uh, basically, I myself had gone on a low-carb diet. I saw my cholesterol go through the roof. But like many people who are more metabolically healthy compared to many other people who are more challenged, I noticed that not only was my LDL going up, but my HDL was going up and my triglycerides were going down. And, and those three together, you know, the high LDL is considered the lousy cholesterol, uh, but HDL being high and triglycerides being low are considered to be uh, good cardiovascular risk factors. I became very interested in this and I became interested in why it was so common. There were so many people going on low carb especially the leaner they were and the more metabolically healthy they were that would see this triad of these three together. And eventually the, I identified something in a blog post that I called lean mass hyperresponders. I was lifting, list, lifting the hyperresponder part from prior things I had read and then adding lean mass because observationally it seemed like these three were often together, these three together. And I tried for a while getting it done through traditional channels but eventually I just decided to crowdfund it and I managed to get the community, the low carb community to help pay for it. And now uh, and I'm skipping a whole lot of stuff. Here we are 2023. We recruited a hundred people that are like at the borderline level of these lean mass hyperresponders I was just describing. And they've now been matched to a control group. It's called a match control because it comes because it comes from another study of also metabolically healthy individuals, but who are not on a low carb diet, who are more on a mixed diet, but who have substantially lower levels of LDL cholesterol. Ours have very high levels of LDL cholesterol at around 272 average. They have very um, more average, I would say, levels of LDL cholesterol at around 123. And the big news, I just I'll just jump right into it, is that they have statistically no difference in plaque, given these um, scans that we're doing in the study called CT angiograms. CT angiograms are high resolution scans that can pick up plaque that's found in the coronary arteries of the heart. And that, in spite of the fact that our lean mass hyperresponders have been at these levels for about 4.7 years. So that's the major finding. Uh, the other finding that's of course very relevant to us is that there's a seemingly no correlation between the levels of LDL graduating up with both of these populations and the corresponding plaque that was found. Uh, at both groups, by the way, generally having lower plaque, which is common for people who are metabolically healthy, but somewhat of a surprise. It wasn't surprising to us per se, but it was surprising that we could finally get this uh, data out in hand. Uh, so that's kind of, that's my best version of an elevator pitch. Nick, how do you, how you feel I did? I do pretty good at cutting out all of the, the other stuff. <laughs> I want to, I, I, I want to amplify it through um, analogy. And I, I kind of want to break it into two parts. One is the scientific nerdy curiosity part. Dave was talking about different biomarkers and stuff. The phenotype we're studying, lean mass hyperresponders, which we can describe again, is just a mark. It's, it's a combination of three lipid or cholesterol levels is so bizarre. If you have any, you know, scientific background that the way I've explained it before, it's like, you know, if somebody walked into a room and they were eight feet tall, you look at them like, what the heck's going on? So this triad of markers is kind of like that. Now, imagine, you know, you see an eight foot tall guy and you write about it. This was Dave blog post in 2017. And then like a bunch of other, you know, it's not just one guy. It's like, there's now a whole population, like a whole population of humans who just happen to be eight feet tall. It's bizarre, right? It's curious. And, um, the saga of this research has been about understanding, you know, this very unusual phenotype, not like anything you've seen before, but it's compounded by the fact that no, it's not being eight feet tall, but it has to do with the triad of markers, one of which is the major biomarker that gets focused on for a major worldwide killer, cardiovascular disease, which everybody is, you know, obviously in medicine concerned about because it kills so many people. And you have this LDL cholesterol factor, which is so astronomically high, which in this population from a medical standpoint is extremely scary. 
and to patients as well. Dave can tell you about his emotional response. I can tell you about mine since we kind of both fit into this um, phenotype. So there's the element of this is something weird that really hasn't been studied. And the other part of the story that I think complements it is kind of the, the human and scientist aspect. Uh, Dave is a, an incredible scientist and gentleman. He's also an outsider. And um, typically, major breakthroughs in science come from within science, from established scientists. So to have something that started as just an, just an engineer's observation, right? They then snowballed into him, you know, putting out papers with colleagues, you know, building an army of people with bona fides and credentials and training behind him who are like, you know, this guy's onto something. To have it then, you know, snowball into multiple papers and now this study, which he crowdfund crowdfunded and produces these incredible results is, you know, it, it's, it's uh, let's just say it harmonizes with the pure scientific curiosity and is one reason I think that this is such a, a powerful story that we see evolving. So um, human aspect and, and scientific aspect, which, you know, we can definitely dig into, but I thought it was a new way to frame it. Always trying something new. It's, it's such an interesting thing for me. And when I look at, you know, my physical numbers from a year ago to my physical now, my LDL has gone through the roof, but everything else has improved. Yeah. You know, everything yeah, else about my, it's, it's just crazy. Cause that's like when you go and see the doctor, all they focus on is LDL. Oh, that's bad. Well, and this is, yeah. this is the experience all around the world. Like right now in 2015 was when I'd first gotten my first lab and this term hyper responder, it came from reading uh, just a couple blog posts, but I was, I was stunned that there just wasn't that. And I, of course, like many people, I thought maybe this is just really unique to me. Maybe this is just, or I'm just a very, very, very rare odd oddity that this would occur to and so, yes, a lot of this research was initially driven by fear. Not that all of the fear has disappeared, but that became the impetus for which, as Nick mentioned, I was kind of leaving the engineering that I was doing in order to focus almost entirely on uh, trying to understand lipidology and the initial beginnings of what we now call the lipid energy model. Now, I want to kind of, I kind of want to do to Nick what Nick just did to me. Here I am, I'm writing blog posts, I'm kind of getting a gist of what this is, and I start doing lectures where I'm bringing it around. And unfortunately, I was not able to just find anybody in academia or in medicine or science to get interested in this phenotype, which I thought was so unique, just as Nick mentioned. It's like all of a sudden, you find that there's a bunch of eight foot tall people where it's not expected, okay, well, this is such a unique opportunity if it's already assumed that this is going to be at a high risk. And so I'm thankful that there was at least enough out there that I could eventually connect with Nick. And Nick also happened to uh, be good friends with somebody else who became an important part of our trio, who's not on with us right now, which is Adrian Sotomoda, who's a fantastic whiz with numbers and statistics and we ended up doing a lot of the early beginnings of what ended up becoming the published version of this phenotype we're talking about. And also ultimately the lipid energy model itself. And I just, I have to say, had I, had I come across Nick earlier, I would have thought all of these people, you know, in Harvard were just as voracious as he is in moving forward all of the publications that he does, I'd be like, oh, Harvard students, second year Harvard students are just publishing papers like mad. No, I'm telling you, Nick is was a unique case of somebody who, if I'm going to be a little bit uh, selfish, I'm glad, <laughs> turned out to be himself a lean mass hyperspawner because his interest got peaked and he's a big part of why you're able to see what's in the literature right now. And so I'm, I'm very thankful for him also being a part of this, this new LMHR study that we're doing that's out of UCLA with the CT angiograms. The, this has only been public for a few days. That's correct. Well, and I mean, the study has oh, been sorry, known for a while, but yes, the findings mm. have been public for a few yeah. days. 
So the findings have been public for a few days and I've kind of been lurking around Twitter over those few days and things are just, there's so much pushback. Oh yeah. We, to be fair, we kind of anticipated a lot of it. We, there's a lot of critiques that were coming along the way, but that said there, there have been some creatively interesting new ones but mostly it's the ones we, we were anticipating. The, the, the one that I had literally just talked with Nick on a, on a uh, Twitter space from earlier that I continue to find surprising is that there's a lot of folks that feel it's so established, the lipid hypothesis that high LDL will result in greater risk for cardiovascular disease is so established that we should not even study these folks. And as I keep bringing forward, there were non-adherents people who were refusing lipid lowering steps long before like I was even born. Uh, and even as it became more present in the guidelines, it didn't matter. There were still lots of people who just wouldn't have done it, whether they were on a keto diet or not. So naturally I think it's, you do what's known as a, a natural history experiment where you go ahead and say, Hey, since you're doing this anyway, can we at least collect data on you since you're set on this path? And if you do, there are actually benefits to that. If the science is correct, if the lipid hypothesis is correct, then you could show the non-adherence that indeed they are at a higher risk. So it really could be a study that could help prove the lipid hypothesis because they have high LDL for unique reasons that we had never quite had before. I think I'll hand that one off to, to Nick in a moment. But I just want to say with regard to this specific criticism, with regard to whether we should study these folks or not, that literally is at the core of science itself. It's, it's fair if it were an intervention, if we were telling people to refuse treatment themselves. It's quite a different story if that's already where they were to just go ahead and collect the data as it stands because there's so many benefits that I think push back against that criticism. Yeah, I was. we were talking about this earlier and um, an analogy came to me that the criticisms that have been posed People are trying to push back. I think a lot of the pushback, and I'll give you some examples of why I think this, are very emotional and not really well thought out. Part of it has to do with just the reaction to this is data coming from Dave's story. And, and people don't like Dave sometimes for just being an outsider. But, um, you know, pushback is supposed to serve as an obstacle to something you don't like. But when it's really weak pushback, it ends up acting as a springboard because you create a straw man that is just knocked down by the sheer presence of the data. So a large, you know, there are kind of two groups of weak criticisms that I've seen. One is just a gross misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the study. Like the example they brought up where the person's like, you know, it's unethical that they're causing, the, they're forcing these people to raise their LDL. It's like, no, we're not. That's just not true. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Um, or other examples where people just have not bothered to learn what the phenotype is. A very prominent lipidologist whose initials are TD um, <laughs> keeps on like saying this isn't a thing that's been published on. And then you send links like here are four or five papers on it. And then two minutes later, it's like this hasn't been published on. Oh, where are the DEXA scans? It doesn't know the definition of the phenotype, even when you put out a little pretty picture. So when there's clear lack of will and engagement, a lack of will to even engage with the ideas, you misrepresent it, you show your naivete and ignorance then yeah, you're just springboarding it. You're not really presenting a, a strong criticism. The other class of really weak criticisms are the ad hominem attacks, which are just laughable. The one doctors had a tweet about the, the keto CT, CTA study, which is this study, was, uh, you know, is, is Dave's like dogged attempt to like validate a diet he likes. I'm like, dude, you're really going to go there? Like you can, but it just looks pathetic on your part. <laughs> this, this is a... Is a, a, a trial match trial that was just presented you know at an academic conference by a guy with an h index of like 131 which if you're in science is extremely high it's like you're not invalidating the study by taking shots at dave you're just looking like a loser so there's that and and even people one person attacked like the fatherhood of another co-author it's just a little bit embarrassing and i'm you can see i'm smirking because i'm amused because it shows your hand it's an emotional response you're springboarding this by amplifying the discussion the, the reviews of this, you know, on multiple platforms are getting millions of engagements. And it's because, in part, 
people create controversy. But if you create controversy with weak comebacks, you're not taking us down. You're pushing us up. So, you know, I you can tell I'm a little bit in a provocative mood. I've been in a provocative mood for a while. Um, so, yeah, I'll say that straight. Like, I see what you're doing. Please keep doing it because the comebacks have been really weak. I haven't seen any strong comeback or limitation targeted that we haven't already like no study is perfect so we're going to say in the limitation section or just you know in in the commentary like here are limitations of the study every study has limitations of course and we can acknowledge that caveat the interpretations and move forward but when you try to completely invalidate it say this shouldn't be studied attack people you know that's been the bulk of it and please keep it coming because it is uh it's a rocket fuel it draws attention to what they're trying to say look the other way it's I, and to be, to, I was, I was, sorry good i was gonna say it's cognitive dissonance that you know challenges a world view which has been you know ingrained through years and years of training um it's not necessarily inappropriate if you watched um professor budoff's q a one woman it was really interesting um to see the way um this physician framed her question but she started saying we see patients like this and i feel uncomfortable xyz now it was a legitimate question but it was very interesting to hear her frame it in the way of feelings again not illegitimizing the question but um i i do think that there is like it you know this visceral reaction to like this is what we know. This is what the preponderance of evidence shows. And these are data that don't invalidate current models, but they do throw a wrench into them that might force them to evolve if the data continues to bear out in this direction, which I personally think it will. And, and I wanted to just say, I certainly think a lot of people who are critical are themselves coming from the position that they genuinely do believe the Lipin hypothesis and do believe that maybe it's true that it's played up a bit. Maybe it's true that, it's, uh, that our folks are at a lower cardiovascular disease risk than what the guidelines would suggest and they themselves would consider they are moderates, but that this research may be providing too much comfort to those who are at risk who would benefit from treatment. And we, I mean, I think we say this all the time, we can acknowledge that these, that's a different context than what it is that we're specifically studying per what Nick just said, we're going to be upfront about these limitations every which way we can. So I think a lot of the critics who usually aren't the ones on Twitter who are saying a lot of the things that Nick just repeated, they're usually the ones that are saying exactly what I said just now, but yeah, I I kind of joke about this when somebody says, Hey, I think Dave is going to all these lengths to justify his dietary choice. I'm kind of amused, honestly, because it makes me think of like a Sunday Dilbert cartoon where it's go, you're seeing me like eat a steak. And then somebody says, it's really bad for you. And then you go frame by frame and it's like year one, year two. And then there's by the very end, I'm like at this huge, you know, this huge uh, study, this research and so forth all to, uh, take on lipid hypothesis in the context of somebody like me. And then I'm going, okay, guys, peace out. I really just wanted this only for me so that I can know I could enjoy my steak. Thanks guys. Like that's, that's such a huge level of effort <laughs> to get to that point. So I'll concede some, some of the criticism I I've found to be at least a little bit entertaining. If you can, if you can allow yourself to be about that. Do the findings mean that irrespective of anything having high LDL is, is not dangerous or is there more nuance than that? I, I like coming from engineering. A lot of people know what a prototype is. And that's mm. now the analogy I really like to lean into because before you actually know something's possible, usually you have to see it shown in a prototype. And this, this does happen all the time where it's like, whoa, the, this thing, this prototype is doing something that's never thought possible before. Okay. We're really not going to invest too much of our excitement just yet until we've got something confirmatory, which is literally what we're in the process of doing right now. And that even includes, that even includes the same study and that we're hoping to get an extension to it as well. And to that extent, I would say it can be both. It can both be very pivotal, but yet also not be definitive such that we can say, whoa, whoa, this is, this may have been a moment 
that really opened at the door, but we can't really see it all just yet. Yeah, the, the way I would frame it is with respect to what's the hypothesis and what's the outcome. The hypothesis is, okay, we have two groups. One, they're both relatively healthy, and one has exorbitantly high LDL for a time period of, on average, 4.7 years. What would the av average person, without seeing the outcome, predict? I would say the average physician would probably say, you know, the group with a very, very high LDL is going to have more plaque. What were the results? They didn't have more plaque. And so what do you make of that? You know, if you're if, if that was your standing hypothesis and it's incorrect, then you need to reevaluate why you were wrong about this prediction, about this hypothesis. Um, it doesn't mean that high LDL is always safe. There's, of course, more nuance. I mean, this whole thing is about identifying circumstances potentially in which high ApoB, you know, as as Professor Budoff put it in his presentation, basically paraphrasing from him, he does not think all, all high LDL is necessarily pathogenic. We do know, and this is where things get into the nitty gritty and the semantics. When somebody says, you know, um, ApoB or LDL particles are causal, that's true because they're part of the causal pathway. They're necessary. That's also true. But it doesn't follow that they're alone sufficient. So what are the circumstances if they exist, which they clearly do since we have, you know, patients with high LDL without cardiovascular disease in which this causal factor can be very high and yet you don't get the disease. And why would that be? So the way I would frame it is these data don't jive with what would be the most likely um, predicted outcome by your average, you know, medical doctor based on current trainings. And now we need to evaluate why that is. Um, so there was, you know, a, a very intense exposure, very high LDL, pretty long duration. So um, it doesn't mean high LDL is safe, but it does mean that, you know, these data aren't consistent with maybe standing predictions by most. And that is provocative. I really like the way Dave said it. Um, it's, it's pivotal without being definitive. All data needs to be validated. Another thing I'll say is I use the term preponderance of evidence a lot because it's one that um, academics and people in medicine like to use to um, comment on the idea that, look, no one study invalidates a field. You have to take the body of evidence and then apply that body of evidence. But the preponderance of evidence really applies mostly to populations on which the data were collected. Now, lean mass hyperresponders are, until this study, with respect to risk, completely unstudied. So the whole preponderance of evidence thing starts to break down a little bit because the preponderance of evidence wasn't collected in these people. And now we're studying these people, and they don't align with the preponderance of evidence. So what do you do with that? or these data aren't consistent with the idea that they align. It does get complicated and messy on social media because all these things have very particular meanings, things like causal, necessary, sufficient. Um, you know, the precision and wording is, is very highly valued in, in academia that doesn't necessarily translate well to social media. So all these things can kind of be, you know, held as consistent. But um, yeah, it doesn't jive with probably existing hypotheses and that is extremely provocative i guess the the trouble on social media or the trouble in the news and the trouble trying to convince the average person of something is that it needs to be in a sound bite and when you've got stuff that involves all the the context and nuance and the you know the nitty-gritty it starts to the message starts to get lost right so um it's hard to communicate to to for a doctor for example to communicate to their patient even if they wanted to that okay well the the high ldl may not be bad but it may be bad it depends on a lot of other situations it depends on i don't know whether you've been a smoker or something for your whole life things like that yeah i guess i the thing i'd say is like where do you put the the responsibility and the onus because the average person right this can go over their head, understandably so. And so when there's like bickering among, and I take part in that bickering completely admittedly, among people on different sides of this issue, it becomes very confusing. My take will be the onus should be on those on both sides to accurately represent the position of the other 
based on what the other said. And I bring this up because there's a lot of times where people are like, you know, Nick and Dave are doing this for this reason. This is their motivation or this is what they're saying. I'm like, we never said that. We just didn't even come close to saying that. That's your caricature of us. That's maybe been built from, you know, the social media filter, but that was never in the publications. In fact, the publications say opposite to what you just said. Um, and, you know, we've never claimed that. So, like, if you want to have an evolved dialogue and we hold ourselves to the same standard, go to the horse's mouth and then have an evolved nuanced discussion, you know, with the people who should be able to communicate the nuance rather than trying to caricaturize them in order to diminish them. Because that's when things get messy. So um, that's my thought on that. Let me, yeah, let me expand on that because uh, this is one thing that I don't love about social media is a lot of times somebody will have a contrarian position. Sorry about that. That's on my end. Uh, a lot of times somebody will have a contrarian position where they say, oh, Dave is saying, I, people are telling me that you're saying high LDL is fine. And I'm going, no, I can give you my full, my full nuanced position. Here it is. And then that same person who I've told that to, who has a huge platform, I'm going, please, I mean, please go ahead and retweet what I just told you so that you can help me spread the word that that's not what I'm saying. When they both don't do that and they continue to say that they're concerned at how often they keep hearing this from people who aren't understanding my position. At that point, I feel like there's there's not much point in uh, putting more time into the discussion because clearly that doesn't seem to be their interest. If if it were my interest, if if I thought Nick were saying something that I believe to be dangerous, I confront him online publicly and I say, Nick, you're I think what you're telling people to do, drinking uh, cyanide. Is a big problem. And it goes, I don't know where you're hearing that. This is my actual position. And then a week later, <laughs> and then a week later, <laughs> we get that in a minute. yeah, we should, we should add that actually in a sec, but then a week later, uh, I'm going, yeah, this is the big problem. Cause Nick is constantly getting people to drink cyanide and Nick, says, wait a sec, I just took the time to both tell you and give you the opportunity to correct the record for the very people you say you're interacting with who are getting the wrong impression. Then at that point, it's hard not to feel like there's some uh, disingenuous behavior. It's deeper than that, though, because it's not even just us saying it. It's like, all right, let's go like collect like nine other co-authors and write an editorial in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology with the senior author that you recommended I recruit. And they're like, ah, we're just going to ignore that, too. So <laughs> it's just like, it, it's so selective. And you should, yeah, you shouldn't bury the lead on that. Quite literally, that's exactly what Nick did. Nick took the time to write an editorial and you didn't just publish it anywhere. It got published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology and has an all-star group of co-authors to it. So for sure, if anybody wants to find out what Nick's position is, you can go there. It's carefully written. It's very well done. And I myself link to it all the time when people are trying to tell me what they think Nick is saying. And I can be like, it's right here. It's, and it's got a DOI next to it. So yeah. here you go. And some people haven't, like, admittedly, some people do have an open mind. The second author on that is Michael Mindrum, who is a critic of our first paper. And I'm like, look, like, let's come together and, and let's be clear that this is, the way I put it is, you know, a phenotype that deserves clinical concern for the patient, but also like urgent research because there's so much we don't know about this. So the only time I get frustrated are when people try to mischaracterize the phenotype and or try to suppress the research because they consider it, you know, a dangerous question, which is just stupid. I'm sorry. Well, well, there should be no dangerous questions, right? So it should just be when like, every, ethically, we should just be getting to the science. Exactly. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. I said when pursued ethically. Some people are trying to mm. misrepresent this as unethical study design. But like, yeah, natural experiment. This is totally ethical. We should absolutely ask these questions. This is ongoing, right? So where where does this go from here? What are the next steps? So th this study and this part I didn't mention yet, uh, the match analysis is one part of it that actually developed a uh, partway into the development uh, of the study itself. The actual study as it's planned is what's called longitudinal. So those hundred scanned participants, 
they will then get a second set of scans, most of which are done now. And th those second scans will have been completed in February. And what's neat is that means you can compare the first set of scans to the second set of scans to see plaque progression. Now, the average age for our population is 55. So they do, we did expect that they would have some amount of plaque at baseline for a portion of them. I'm happy to say that in both groups in the match, in both Miami Heart and in ours, most of them don't. Most of them have a plaque score of zero, uh, no detectable plaque that they can see. Uh, but for those that do have some detectable plaque, that is at least useful for the following, because then you can follow how much those plaques do or do not grow. Again, for people who are in the middle in their middle age, not only will they likely have plaque, they likely will develop plaque. So I do want to manage expectations for people who are thinking, oh, well, if there's no plaque at all that develops, that shouldn't be your starting point because every population, I don't care what diet you're on, this even includes people with PCSK9 loss of function. They develop cardiovascular disease and the older you are, the more likely it is that you're going to be developing it. So we'll see what those results show, uh, but we'll probably know that at some point after February, once it can finally come together for publication. Nice. So, um, and then at that point, that's going to like that, that's it or does it continue from there like the, does that you you continue to measure from there or well the the hope is and this is something that hasn't been fully nailed down yet but i'm hoping that we'll actually get an extension to the study it's it's ongoing there's some negotiating and there's some needing to get the budget for it but i think it may happen where indeed we'll still publish what we got to in february but we may be going back to our original recruits and saying, hey, could you come back for one more time? And uh, I can't speak to the details beyond that, but it would be for another scan that might be, say, you know, um, a year later, two years later, something along those lines, so that there'll be a third scan for which there can be a further comparison between the two, uh, between all three. Nick was just uh, walking past the screen before with some, or uh, I guess it was Oreo cookies. Yeah, I'm um, teasing about ir irresponsible things that scientists do. So um, there was also talk on um, social media lately about uh, an Oreo experiment you were doing. Do you, could you talk about that? Sure. So um, kind of tying this back to the beginning of the podcast, we talked about you know looking at this phenotype and thinking it's so bizarre. We used the eight-foot-tall man analogy. Um, but you know, another way to look at the weirdness of this phenotype is based on metabolic responses and, um, based on how we understand how this phenotype arises, this triad of high HDL, high LDL and low triglycerides, the lipid energy model that was, uh, Dave's brainchild in which we eventually got out into the literature, it makes certain predictions. And so you can test those predictions. And one way to test the prediction behind the lipid energy model is, you know, the lipid energy model would predict if you have a lean mass hyperresponder and you pump up their liver glycogen stores, that will remove the driving force for their increased LDL cholesterol. And so the LDL cholesterol should go down. And that should work. It doesn't matter how you replete the liver glycogen. So you could, you know, go to a low fat vegan diet. Or you could just stay on your baseline, you know, ketogenic diet it could be like a carnivore diet and just pump up the carbs in any form. Enter the Oreo. So this was something that um, I designed based on inspiration from Dave's experiments, like his white bread experiment and input from my PCP supervising. We had a consultant expert cardiologist. And we were, and, and the protocol ended up being, I'm going to compare Oreo treatment for lowering my LDL to a statin. A pretty high dose actually is 20 milligrams of Crestor resuvastatin, which is a pretty potent statin. And so the idea was go on Oreos for a, a couple weeks and then have a washout period, go on the statin for six weeks and see how the two compare. The first big question is, will Oreos actually lower my LDL? The answer was, because this has already been revealed on social media, yeah. They lowered my LDL like crazy, like dropped it like a rock by um, an absolute reduction of 71%, which is far stronger than most medications in most trials. 
and I did it in 16 days, my LDL went from 384 to 111. It really just tanked. And that was not a swap. I literally was just taking my diet and just shoving Oreos in my mouth on top of it. Um, more or less. You can see the protocol as it was laid out. But then I had a washout period, and now I'm in the last phase where I have the statin treatment, getting my cholesterol every single week. Um, you know, my PCP orders it, it goes into my Epic chart. This isn't like, you know, me porting my, you know, data and a cholesterol check or whatever. This is as above board, I have ethics for it and everything. And so there's intent to publish. I have some expert consultants on board where it is now is a few weeks out from having the final data set, at which point, you know, I'll publish it and it'll be a pretty rigorous N equals one. And if the, well, we already know that the Oreo dropped the LDL, but, you know, is it possible? The headline could be like Harvard medical student uses Oreo cookies to drop his LDL with, you know, more than a statin, something like that. It's intellectually provocative, which is what we're trying to be, quite honestly, in, I think, a reasonable manner, because this is so freaking cool. This is so curious. The fact that this would work, it's not recommending. I'm not, this is not a healthy thing to do, but because it's not a healthy thing to do, or it's presumed not to be a healthy thing to do, that draws this really uncomfortable question to the fore because the LDL did drop. So was it a healthy thing to do? And how do you, you know, resolve that? In any case, it's a metabolic demonstration that's, you know, quite curious and it does have quite a bit of flair to it. So, you know, part of this game of research is using the resources you have to kind of push, you know, curiosity in your topic forward. Dave and I don't have a lot in terms of research. We don't have, a you know, $10 million in grant funds or even $1 million in grant funds or even $100,000 in grant funds. But we have social media as a tool. We have our models. And, you know, in this case, it's just, it's pretty easy to go out there and say, look, I have this prediction. I'm telling you what it is. This is what I'm going to do. Now follow me on this journey as I do it. And then I'll publish the results. So that was that experiment. We actually um, presented it on a... Um, a uh, 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 vegan uh, YouTube channel, um, Chris McCaskill's Plant Chompers. He was a great host, but um, that was a little while ago. And yeah, now I'm getting to the end of that. So that's one of many other studies we have popping out. So this, um, you know, study release um, was, you know, just kind of flicking the first domino. The actual publication is going to come out. We have, I mean, Oreo cookies is just for a little bit of flair, but then other publications, two already accepted, two more in the pipeline. 2024 is going to be a really exciting year for us. Dave and Nick, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and talk about what's been happening. Um, where can people reach out to you? Where can they read more of your stuff? Where can they follow you? Well, we're, we're both very active on Twitter slash X. My user handle is uh, at real Dave Feldman. Second to that would be YouTube also at real Dave Feldman. And, I do dabble in Instagram. I'm really not that active there. Outside of that, if you want to help support this research, come to citizensciencefoundation.org, and we will be. Um, we you can actually donate there. We're also going to have a conference out soon, where you can come to Las Vegas in the middle of March, and as your contribution is your ticket, you can come and actually watch some great speakers. I'll be announcing that uh, tomorrow, and yeah, that's basically the best way to reach me. Similar. Um, I'm at Nick Norwitz on Twitter, which is probably where I'm the most active. Also on YouTube, just look up Nick Norwitz. I don't think there's another Nick Norwitz on the planet, so I'm not hard to find. Um, I've been a little bit more active on on YouTube, which has been fun. But yeah, those two platforms. And uh, we try to engage as much as possible. So feel free to ask questions, leave comments. Um, it's a really exciting part of being part of this world. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us.